Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. Welcome back to another episode of Fearless. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in Alaska with the opportunity to interview Andrew and Noreen Brunson. Little did we know, just a couple of weeks later, Andrew and I would both be on a national stage, me talking about religious freedom, and he talking about his release from prison in Turkey. Most of us will never know what it's like for physical persecution or to be imprisoned because of our faith. Andrew does. And I was in awe when I asked him if he would be on my podcast, Fearless. And I think you would be interested to hear what he has to say. To me personally, this is one of the most powerful episodes of Fearless we have had. And I'm excited for you to be able to listen. I encourage all Christians to listen to what Andrew has to say about his faith while he was in prison in Turkey. Today, I'm completely honored to have two special guests with me, and that is Andrew and Noreen Brunson. And Andrew is a North Carolina pastor, although he says he's not from North Carolina. He's uh, lived all over the world, but they planted an evangelical church in Turkey, and they had been serving there for more than 20 years. And one day, that all would change on October 7th, 2016, when they were arrested and falsely accused of being involved in an attempted coup against the Turkish government. And they were obviously charged with false terrorism charges. Noreen would soon be released, but Andrew uh, continued and endured two years in prison until he was set free on October 12th, 2018. But we are in Alaska and I've had the joy of getting to know and talking with Andrew and Noreen. We have met in passing before at other events in New York or in Washington, but never have had time to sit down with him. So thank you all for being on the podcast, Fearless. And we'll get to that because when I asked him to be a part of Fearless, what did you tell me? I said, we're not fearless. <laughs> and it took me back and we're. Gonna, I wanna address that as we go on. But for many people, they remember the headlines of an American pastor released from Turkey. They remember the images of you before the president of the United States and praying over him. But most people that are listening might not know the full story. So explain to me how the two of you got to Turkey and how God called you there and what your life was like that for 20 years in Turkey. Well, we knew that God wanted us to go to the Muslim world. Uh, we were not planning on Turkey. Uh, it, it was not a place we really wanted to go. And in fact, when we got on the plane to go over there, Noreen was crying and thinking, oh, my life is over. I'm going to Turkey. Uh, we were headed toward Egypt, but our church asked us to go to Turkey. Uh, and so we went in submission to that. And uh, we really didn't want to be there. It was more of obedience. And then in the first few years that we were there, God began to put some of the love he has for Turkey into our hearts. So it wasn't a, an attachment like a romanticized, idealized, uh, oh, we love Turkish food, we love Turkish culture and all that, although there are things that we like, obviously, but it was much more of uh, a love beginning to grow and that love expressed in uh, a commitment to see blessing, uh, to see the kingdom of God come to that country. And I would just add that the Lord somehow worked in my heart, I'm not sure how, so that uh, at about the four-year mark, I just knew we were supposed to be there. And that was such a huge blessing as we, you know, faced setbacks and ups and downs. But just to know we are supposed to be here, and that helps you press through. So that was, just, was actually a huge grace. And you have how many children? Three. Three. And so they born in Turkey? The boys were born there. And mm -hmm. of course raised, and that's their home. Yes. And that's what they know. But on t October 7th of 2016, your life changed yeah, and can you explain what that day looked like and the details of that day? Yeah, so we were invited to go into the local police station, and uh, we didn't, we weren't uh, concerned about that because we had applied for a long term residence permit so we could live in Turkey permanently without any problems. And we thought we were going to pick up those papers. So we went in happily to go get our papers, and instead they said, We are, there's an order to deport you. Uh, and we're going to arrest you and hold you for deportation. 
So this really shocked us. We had been there 23 years uh, at that time, and we really believed that uh, there was an assignment for us to prepare for harvest. And this is what I believe God had spoken to me in 2009, prepare for harvest. So we thought, wait, how can we be deported, kicked out of this country? When we're supposed to be here, we have an assignment. Uh, And then they did arrest us. They held us together for 13 days, uh, the two of us together. And uh, we began to realize that this was not a normal process. Normally, if one is deported, it will take about, for an American, one or two days only. Uh, But they held us, they kept us from seeing a consul, they kept a lawyer from seeing us, and we began to see that something was was wrong. Uh, Noreen was released after 13 days, but then they kept me for another two years. Uh, So, yes, our lives were turned upside down. Uh, Now, one thing that we, I thought when they told us they were deporting us, I thought, Lord, did I do something wrong? Did I... Did I mess mess up so that I've been disqualified from this assignment to prepare for harvest? And then as the imprisonment extended, we came to see that actually my being in prison was serving the harvest. It was serving God's purposes because a worldwide prayer movement started. God uh, raised it up. He carried it forward. So he initiated it and he sustained it and it spread all over the world. We began to see all of this prayer pouring into Turkey and uh, slowly began to realize, wait, actually, the assignment for harvest is still valid. It's just we're serving it in a very different way than we had expected. So the way we see is that all this prayer that was coming in for Andrew, he was like a magnet pulling it in, but it was spilling over into the country for blessing, for softening, for preparing for the harvest. So Andrew started to fear as we, you know, this took some time to realize, to start to see what's going on. Uh, but then he started to fear that he was worth more to God, that he was more valued to God in prison than out of prison. Uh, he might just leave me here for a long time while he raises more and, and more And let the prayer, prayer continue. <laughs> what at point did you realize that prayer was pouring in because of the communication? What did your communication look like once she was released? Did well, you- I, was, I was taken uh, the same, the day she was released, they took me in the middle of the night to a different uh, detention center and they put me into a solitary uh, confinement and uh, held me like that for for 50 days. Uh, Noreen was allowed to see me. Uh, It wasn't regular at the beginning, then it it became more regular. After they put me into, and that's when we heard, you know, some of the prayers starting. Uh, But then I was transferred into a high security prison and there my contact was cut off. And- uh, Initially. Initially, and that's where I really began to, well, I was already breaking. I should say, I thought I was a relatively tough missionary. And uh, just some background on Turkey, it's the largest unevangelized country in the world. There are maybe 6,000 believers from a Muslim background out of over 80 million people. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult field. And we had been missionaries for a number of years. We'd been involved in several church plants, and there had been threats because of that. And I was attacked by a gunman once, and we'd also worked on the Syrian border uh, with refugees. And so there was some risk associated with that. So I thought, you know, we've endured for years. We've worked among Muslims. Mm-hmm. If that's not something that will make you really popular to start churches in Muslim place. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm relatively toughened up. And then uh, I landed in, in prison and, and I broke. And I, I found out I, I was surprised that I broke so quickly and so thoroughly and so many times. Uh, I hadn't expected that. And I think one of the main reasons that I broke was my expectations. Uh, I had pursued intimacy with God, presence of God for a number of years. And uh, I assumed from reading biographies that I would have a real sense of, of strength. I would feel God's grace. And even though it would be difficult that there would be a sense of joy and especially of God's presence. And uh, I had the sense of God's presence completely left me. And I felt abandoned and I felt the silence of God for the two years I was in prison. And so this, um, it took me into a crisis of relationship with God. Like, where are you, God? Uh, During my easier times, you have been there. Mm-hmm. And we've had encounters and I've heard your voice and I've just I've been discovering your father heart and to live as your son. 
And now in my most difficult time, I feel abandoned, betrayed in a sense. Now, God never abandoned me. That's just the way I felt. So I was struggling through um, a real crisis with, with God, and I had a lot of offense in my heart toward him. Now, God began to rebuild me after all this breaking. So the first year, I especially say that I was, I was broken many times. And the second year, there was a rebuilding process. Uh, and that rebuilding process, one of the very important things was dealing with that, uh, with that offense in my heart and putting it aside and saying, I, I, I cannot hold the fence because if I do, then, it, then I can't receive from God anymore. And so when I, when I put that aside, then God began a rebuilding process. I still had a lot of fear since this is a fearless podcast. Uh, <laughs> I had fear and I think it's normal to have fear. And the real issue uh, isn't whether we have fear or not, it's what we do when we are afraid. When I am afraid, am I going to stand or am I going to run? Mm. And uh, this is one of the things on my heart is to speak to other believers as pressure is increasing uh, in our country now uh, toward people who who take a clear stand for Jesus, identify with him publicly, uh, and to prepare ahead of time and make a decision that you will stand for him so that when the situations come that, that make us fearful and we will be afraid, then instead of running, we will be resolute and, and stand. And I think t- talking to you last week, it was a great reminder to me, you know, here on this podcast, I encourage Christians to stand boldly and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because we have a culture that is forever compromising, especially here in America. For me, I've seen the aftermath. I've traveled the world. I've been in countries where I've seen religious persecution and the aftermath of war. And I've had a father who has set a beautiful example to me of um, being unashamed of the gospel. But with our conversation the other day, I was convicted that I haven't encouraged people enough here on this podcast. See, there are going to be times that we are fearful. And what a beautiful Reminder, it's what we do in those moments when we are afraid. And what would you, and you might not have an answer for that because there's probably not a universal answer. And you said that second year it changed. Was there something that happened in your heart or with your communication with Noreen as you saw it was gaining international attention? What Was there a moment that you're like, okay, God, you are still here with me. You haven't abandoned me. There was a major change when I, I was transferred to a maximum security prison. And uh, I had had some real big disappointments and I'd hit bottom and I was suicidal. And I had been broken. I'd lost 50 pounds. I really had lost hope. President Trump had asked for my release and it had been rejected and instead things got worse. And so I thought, I'm really, I, I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, so I, I spent two years in prison and I didn't know that it would be two years. So if I had known, then it would be really hard, but I'd start to count the days. But it was very difficult to have uncertainty. Uh, Nobody knew when I'd get out. I didn't know if I'd ever get out. And the Turkish government eventually was asking for three life sentences for me in solitary confinement. So I thought, I don't know if I'm ever going to be with my children again. I don't know if I'll be with my wife again. So that uncertainty, the sense of isolation that I had, uh, I was always with, uh, in the prisons with, all my psalmists were, were Muslim, they were very committed Muslims, and I was the only believer, and the only Christian. And so, uh, and then with my disappointments with God, my struggles there, uh, it broke me, and I lost a lot of confidence in him. I also, I came to realize there are, that I was in a valley of testing, of severe testing, and that many believers don't survive the valley of testing. Uh, they may go to heaven and all that, but, but their relationship, their friendship with God doesn't survive. Mm. And I thought, I'm really in danger of that because uh, I feel so wounded and, and abandoned that, that I'm really losing that friendship with God. So I made a decision, God, whatever you do or don't do, I am going to follow you. I can't fight for my freedom. There's very little I can do, but I can fight for my relationship with you. Even, you know, if I don't hear your voice, I'll still follow you. If if you don't give me your presence, I'll still follow you. 
if you don't save me, I'm still going to follow you. And so I, I determined that I would run after him, that I would cling to him. And I began to take steps to do that. And uh, one of the very important steps, I said, was dealing with offense. And I, I'll just explain what I did. I, I imagined a lockbox and I, I visualized putting into it my offense and my questions and my doubts. And then I locked it. And I said, God, you and I are the only ones who can unlock this, this lockbox. And if you want to unlock it and deal with my questions, you can do that anytime you want. But on my part, I, I determine with my will that I will not open this box anymore. Mm. Uh, I do not need to have answers to continue a relationship with you. And so that was a very key thing because I was surrendering those, <laughs> saying, I'm not, I, I'm not going to pursue these anymore. And after that, of course, I had doubts and questions that came in, but I would send them to that box and I, I would not uh, entertain them. I would not give them a place in my mind for very long. Um, a lot of this was a, a decision of the will. It was not an emotional thing. Uh, throughout my two years, I, I did not at any time have a sense of God's presence. Uh, but what happened was a, a, real, a, a real focus on running after him, pursuing him, loving him, being devoted to him. So before I would have said the most important thing for me is God's presence. Mm. And then I discovered in prison what the most important thing for my spiritual life was, was a simple devotion. Am I going to maintain just a simple bear naked devotion to God where I hold on to him no matter what. Uh, so I no, I, I thought after that, well, maybe, maybe now I've learned my lesson and now God will, you know, give me his presence. No, it didn't happen. But I came out of there much stronger. Yeah. And to me, the irony is that I experienced the silence of God in that sense of abandonment, but I came out of there with, a, with a, a stronger and a deeper intimacy with him than I had before I went in. And of course, I don't want to use my story as a comparison by any means of difference, but I think any time in somebody's life, they're going to experience God being silent in their life, um, whether that's marriage issues or financial issues that they're facing and there's doubts and their journey and their walk with faith. For me, there was a um, was something that happened in my life. I never doubted the sovereignty of God. I never, I feel like that was a gift. I never doubted that, but I didn't understand where his presence was in my life of asking some questions that just went silent. And I remember, I didn't even for a couple of years want to open up the Bible. And I can remember just doing it out of obedience. I had no desire to open the Bible because he's been quiet. I just did it out of an obedience of a heart saying, Lord, I'm not going to allow Satan to plant seeds. I will open up your word and your truth. And although I just did it for months, didn't really get anything out of my devotions for months, but just that obedience. And once again, I'm not trying to compare by any means, but to encourage people. Sometimes it's a choice, like you said. It's a choice even when your heart's desire is not there and you feel alone and abandoned to follow Christ with your whole heart. Would you agree? If, is that what you're... So uh, it, people sometimes say, oh, Andrew, you know, I had this struggle, but oh, oh no, it's nothing like yours. And I say, wait, wait, because, <laughs> you know, we, your struggles, your tests are enough to knock you out. And my tests were enough to knock me out. And we're tested in different ways, but the area of the heart that we're tested mm. in is the same. And so, as you said, many people, I think everyone will at some point experience... Uh, what we'd call the silence of God or the dark night of the soul. Mm. And um, we, we, we will, most of us will be tested in this area. And I, a thing I, I, I discovered, this is very precious to God. For example, what you did, where you say, I'm going to keep on. I'm going to be uh, disciplined and I'm going to read the word and I'm going to continue with my commitment in seeking God, even if I'm not feeling it or getting anything out of it that I can see or and this is so precious to God because what I, what I realized at one point is I'm loving God even though I don't feel loved by him. And I had all these questions for God. 
you know, where are you? Why haven't you given me your presence? Why are you speaking to me? Why don't I feel grace? And, and at some point I realized, you know, I have all these questions for God, but he has questions for me. Mm. You know, Andrew, are you going to be faithful? When you feel betrayed, are you going to pass the test of betrayal and still be faithful to me? Are you going to love me even when you don't feel my presence? And so what happened is that I came out of that time with uh, tested and proven love. So I think of people in the military, you know, they can train for, for years, but there's something, there's a difference between someone who's actually been in battle and someone who never has been. And uh, for me, I had loved God for many years, but when I experienced that silence and went into that deep valley, deep, dark valley, um, I maintained. It's, it says, oh, my, my love was now being tested. Before, it was completely real and a completely sincere love. I really did love God, but now it was being tested in the fire, and then it was proven. Mm. And so there's something about knowing that my love and faithfulness has been proven. It gives me a different confidence in my relationship with God. You know, he knows that I was faithful. He knows that I loved him. And I know that he knows. And that gives me a confidence of relationship with him. And so, you know, for your listeners, they're all going to go through things. You know, most of them are not going to end up in prison uh, in, in a foreign country, but they're going to be tested in these areas. Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to keep walking uh, with Jesus even when you don't feel his presence? One of the verses that, that it became my theme verse was Isaiah 50, verse 10. Uh, goes something like this. Um, For the one who walks in darkness and has no light, God is speaking. For the one who walks in darkness and has no light, trust in the name of your God and lean on him. And God could easily have said, oh, you're walking in darkness and you want light. Here, let me give you light. But he didn't. He, he left them in darkness, but said, lean on me. Mm. And so this is one thing I was, I was learning is it was part of the tests God had for me. Now, God doesn't cause all my hardships, but he certainly was using them. And he was teaching me to stand in the dark, as that verse talks about, standing in the dark. And learning to lean into him, even when I don't understand what's happening. And that's what I think of now. I, I, I don't really understand trust. It's so important in the Bible. And there are many different variations of trust. But instead of using the word trust, because we often associate trust with the people say, oh, just trust God. And what they really mean is, it's all going to be all right. We don't know that. Mm. Uh, there, are, there are no guarantees, especially when it comes to persecution. Uh, we don't know what the result will be. Um, and so I've started using the what's in my mind is more leaning into the leadership of Jesus. Uh, that I know you're a good leader. I, I acknowledge you as my leader. And I say you're good and faithful. And I don't understand your leadership, but I am going to lean into your leadership. I should have asked this earlier were you allowed to have a Bible while you're in prison? Yeah, so it varied. I was uh, in five different places, and and some yes, and some no. But uh, as uh, when I was put into the high security prison, after a few months, I was allowed to have one. And so, uh, and you know, that was really important to have the Bible. But I also want to just be very open that reading the Bible uh, did not always encourage me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would read all these verses about the one who endures to the end and you, you know, <laughs> for the one who is victorious. And I'm saying, oh, God, I don't know that I can be, you know, I, I, th I, th I think I'm too weak. Uh, or I saw how much of the Bible is about, you know, uh, right relationships and how to uh, act in the church and all this. And I say, oh, God, I just this isn't speaking to my mm -hmm. to my need right now. And even in the Psalms. Uh, you know, I think David, so many beautiful Psalms and, you know, he's in despair and God rescues him. And then I thought, cynical mind, I thought, yeah, but they never caught him once. <laughs> David was never captured. And so, uh, so it wasn't, people may think, oh, did, did you have the Bible? Then that was just, you know, everything's okay then. No, it didn't always feed me. But uh, 
just even having it in my hand physically, uh, because I thought this represents, you know, my family of faith uh, through the centuries, people who've been faithful, uh, who have suffered for him for centuries. Who have been fearless. Who have been fearless, and some of them. And and I thought this represents that my my what I'm a part of through the centuries. And so it gave me a real comfort even just to hold it in my hand. I just want to mention something because it, it, it helped to define how I thought about the time my mother was allowed to visit me early on. And I was just crying and look, mom, look what's happened to me. This is terrible. And she said to me, she said, Andrew, there's a, there's a long line of people who have suffered for Jesus Christ. And it's a line that goes way back. It goes back 2,000 years. And it's now your turn to stand in that line. And uh, this really sobered me up. And I thought, yeah, there, there are many, many who have gone before me and uh, who have been faithful. And then I thought what, what really inspired me later was thinking there are others coming after me. And if I'm weak, if, I, if I'm not faithful in the end, if I don't hold on, uh, what kind of example am I leaving to those who will, who will suffer after me? So in uh, early months, he would say to me, God chose the wrong man for this. I can't do this. I'm too weak. And then at some point he said, no, I think God chose the right man who, in spite of his weakness, would persevere. Mm. And in that way, be an encouragement to other weak people. Because so many of us are weak, you know. Now, Noreen, of course, we discussed earlier, you, after it was at 13 days, were released. Did they, and of course, you stayed in the country and were able to visit over the next two years with Andrew. Why did you decide to stay? And I'm sure that's obvious because you weren't going to leave your husband, but I'm sure fear just was captivating at some points in your life. I'm sure to walk the streets and to still live in a country. What was your... uh, journey of faith like during that time for you? Yeah, no question that I'm also not a fearless person. (laughs) So there was no question that fear just gripped my heart a number of times, and I didn't know what would happen. I would, I remember in the early days, I'm, you know, carrying a laptop wherever I go. I'm afraid they're going to come into the house and plant something on the computer or um, in our apartment building, there was no elevator, just stairs. And if I would hear, especially men's voices coming up the stairs, I'm like, oh, they're coming for me, you know, especially later at night or something. And just the relief as they would continue upstairs to somewhere else or whatever. So yeah, there's no question that there was uh, fear. At the same time, um, it just kind of became obvious that there needs to be somebody there on the ground um, later on when he was in prison, I was the one who could visit him because they have very strict rules of, you know, next of kin and all who can go in and who can't. Um, and just to kind of try to keep things moving with a lawyer and, and just, you know, I needed to be there basically. And I was, I, yeah, what can I say? I needed to be there. I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there. So no. she stayed at personal risk. And there were there were people we really respect who said, Noreen, you need to go back to the States. And uh, and it was very difficult for her to be there also. Our children were in the States. Uh, they were Some of them were having a difficult time. And uh, yet I'm also falling apart in prison. And she's the only one who can visit me. And she was the only Christian I had contact with during those two years. And so, uh, so at risk to herself, she said, I will leave if God really shows tells me, send me an angel, it has to be that clear, then I will leave. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to support Andrew. So I see her as a lioness. Mm. Uh, she said something interesting to me uh, before she said, you know, I, Andrew, I, I just want to have a quiet life. I, you know, I, and, I, and I said, Noreen, you say that, uh, you know, I kind of pull back and not be in these kinds of stressful situations. And I said, Noreen, you say that, but I see you over the years, again and again, doing difficult things, putting yourself at risk, uh, even when you're afraid, because Noreen does have fear. But even though she was afraid, it was, no, I'm going to do it. And it was a, 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 a commitment and a faithfulness to obey God to what she believed he had assigned to her. And so even staying in Turkey, it was, I'm, I'm going to stay here. Yes, there is fear. But to me, she's a lioness. Mm. She has fear. I said, all of these years you say you want a quiet life, you have continued to put yourself 
in places where there's a lot of stress and a lot of risk for the Lord. I uh, was traveling and uh, saw a necklace, and the name of the necklace was Lionheart. Lionheart, and I felt like God wanted me to get that. So I have that necklace, and whenever I would put it on, it's like, okay, Lord, you want to transform this fearful person into somebody who is a lion heart, somebody who's worthy of, you know, the father that we have. I'm always careful with what I stay to want or not want because the Lord's going to do the opposite. I learned very early on to be careful with my prayers or say I want a quiet life. Because Can I tell you a prayer? Uh, in 2007, uh, I, I began to pray in this way. Father God, draw me so close to your heart that you will be able to trust me with the authority to start waves. And we prayed this because in Turkey, there were no spiritual waves. And I thought, we want to see the kingdom waves come to this land. So I began to pray. It was a, I was praying better than I knew. Father God, draw me so close to your heart that you'll be able to trust me with the authority to start waves. And this started us in a, in a different trajectory. Uh, and God answered my prayer. And I, I just realized yesterday, actually, it suddenly dawned on me because um, I said, draw me so close to your heart. And then I'd usually say, and so then I began to run after God's presence. And we did for years, we ran after mm -hmm. God's presence. And I think as, as we were running after his presence, seeking his face, that that uh, lined us up with his heart so that he could give us assignments. And I believe the prison experience was ultimately an assignment from him. And he gave it to me because of the years of pursuing his heart. He knew that even though I would break, that I would never turn away from him. Even though I'd be very weak, I would still look to him. And so he trusted me with that difficult assignment. And it came from those years of preparation, just seeking intimacy in his presence. But what hit me yesterday was, I say, Father God, draw me so close to your heart. And then I say, and then I started pursuing presence. And I thought, you know, there's a difference between the two. Part of getting drawn close to God's heart is, is seeking his face. But there's so much more in his heart than that. And part of it is the suffering of Jesus. I just thought, you know, that one of the things that I wanted intimacy with him, I wanted to be near his heart, and there are things in his heart that I can't share unless I've experienced some of the same things that he experienced. And so, for example, his feeling abandoned by God. Mm -hmm. You know, here's Jesus, the Son of God, feeling abandoned. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, you know, he let me taste that. And... So now that means there is something now that I can understand about Jesus that I could never have understood if I didn't feel abandoned. The uh, being persecuted for righteousness. You know, Jesus experienced that. Well, now I experienced. I experienced, you know, the slander and uh, false accusations and Jesus forgave his enemies. And now I got to forgive my enemies in, in very stressful circumstances. So I, I realized that God was answering my prayer by letting me go through some very difficult things because going through those uh, has given me, for example, you know, Jesus says, not my will, but yours. This became my battle in prison. Oh God, I, I want to be out of here. My, my purpose is my will is to, is to leave this prison. But if your mm -hmm. desire is, is for me to be here. If this is going to serve your purposes, I don't want to do it, but God, help me. Give me the strength to persevere. And so this is something now I can relate to Jesus. And, and there are a number of these things that I'm just, as I, I'm processing, uh, almost two years later, I'm just starting to see some of what God was doing in my life. Thinking, you know, I asked to draw near his heart and he was drawing me near. Even when, I felt his silence and abandonment, mm -hmm. betrayal. Where are you, God? And what he was actually doing was answering my prayer. I'm drawing you close to my heart. I'm giving you so many experiences mm -hmm. that Jesus had so that now you, you have those little pockets in the heart, little corners here and there that you can relate to that you never could have otherwise. So I believe that prayer is what took me to prison. I'm not going to pray that prayer. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a great prayer because yeah. it's bring me close to your heart. 
And no, I don't think most of us will go to prison, but I say, pray that. We, I call it the Wave Starter Prayer. We, we just started a nonprofit, and that's the name of our nonprofit mm-hmm. is Wave Starters. So I say, pray that. Draw me so close to your heart that you'll be able to trust me with the authority to start waves, because as we draw close to his heart, then he can give us assignments. He can trust us mm-hmm. with assignments for his kingdom. Mm-hmm. Now, and y'all might have different stories because you were seeing the news and knew that this was gaining international attention, especially with President Trump uh, sharing about the story and putting pressure on the Turkish government. But what were those events and those days, maybe the weeks that led up to his release? What was that like? Because you didn't know he was going to be released on that date. We what, didn't. Yeah, what we did didn't. It look like? Yeah. So that by that point he was on house arrest, which was a wonderful thing. I mean, it was it was a, something we never anticipated. It was great, but it was like this is not enough. Now house arrest with you? you house arrest with home? me. Oh, yeah. Wow. They, so I've been in prison all that time, and then after enormous pressure uh, from the U.S. government, they 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 let me out the last two months. I was I was in under house arrest. I couldn't leave the house. It was actually a very tense situation because uh, the um, there had been such pressure from the U.S. and President Trump imposed sanctions on Turkey, and there were already uh, significant problems in the Turkish economy. But that pushed it over the edge, and so their currency collapsed. Uh, their stock market they lost forty billion dollars off of the stock market right away, and they were going to go into a full financial crisis. The whole country. And there were already, as I said, structural problems in the economy, but they used this as an excuse to blame it on President Trump and on me. (laughs) And so, you know, I was one of the most hated men in Turkey. And so there's this tug of war, you know, the U.S. saying, let him go. And and the president of Turkey saying, I will not let him go. And uh, there was uh, a lot, there were a lot of calls to throw me back into prison and, this was a completely political thing, obviously. They knew all along that I was innocent. They were just, it was persecution, and then they were using me as leverage trying to get concessions from the U.S. on a number of issues. So we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know at any point they could come and take me off to prison. And uh, the last, so, and, and there were protests in the streets. There were, I mean, it was it was a huge thing in Turkey, uh, all over the, the media, they still call it the Brunson crisis. So a couple of years later, they still refer to it in, in that way. Uh, so, yeah, I was afraid they would send me back and, and not let me go, ever. <laughs> uh, the actual court experience, I had already been through three court sessions. And so this time, that my fourth uh, court uh, session, they moved very quickly to convict me. And I, I was just surprised because they... Uh, first, some of the witnesses started falling apart. It was very clear that their their case was uh, was falling apart. But uh, then they suddenly moved to convict me, and they did. They mm-hmm. said uh, they found me guilty of supporting terror, and so I'm standing there uh, as they're sentencing me. And I thought, oh, all that prayer, all that pressure, they're going to put me back into the maximum security prison. It didn't work, and I don't know when I'll get out. So they sentenced me, they convict me and sentenced me. And I'm, I just kind of faded out. I'm standing in front of the judges. <laughs> and uh, Noreen was just telling me this morning, she was just saying, oh God, hold his heart. Because mm. she's way in the back, far away from me. And just knowing that I'm devastated. Um, so God, just hold his heart. So I kind of faded out. I thought, Lord, can I, I hope you put me back in the same prison with the same cellmate so that I don't have to meet new people and just back to a place I'm familiar. And then suddenly my lawyer is saying, okay, Andrew, you've been released. And uh, so I think of it as, uh, and then there's the mad dash to get us to the airport and out of the country before the president changes his mind and wow. throws me back in prison. So the roller coaster of basically some hours in hell as we think about it. So that was all on the same day. Oh, it was in a, yes, it was, I'm back on trial. Now I'm, they've convicted me. They have sentenced me to prison. And then suddenly, okay, we, we, we've sentenced you to prison, but now we're releasing you while you appeal this. So clearly a political decision. And, and I'm free to leave the country. So just the, you know, the, the roller coaster of emotions that you go through, he had packed two bags, one to go back to prison, 
one in case he was released. But, you know, they came to get him that morning of the court session at, I don't know, five in the morning, four in the morning, something like that. And I'm saying goodbye to him. And what kind of goodbye is this? Mm-hmm. Is this goodbye and I'll see you tonight? Or is it goodbye and you're back to prison? So there was just the total uncertainty. So at that moment we your release, I'm sure that was a rush to the airport. Yeah. Um, I believe, because I've heard this story, Tony Perkins, the Family mm-hmm. Research Council, was with you, maybe your lawyers. What was that rush to the airport like? And when did you feel like you could breathe and say, it's over? Well, it was pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty exciting rush to the airport. Um, and then the media got there in no time at all. Um, of course, I wasn't having to drive or anything. We could just sit there and, you know, we're in this car being taken to the airport, hope that everything will go okay. But the media's there. And then we got into part of the airport and all of a sudden it was just quiet. And we had a chance just to even record a quick, we love Turkey. We, you know, we bless Turkey and just kind of leave with message that message. Yeah. Um, what, even though we've been through difficulties, we still love Turkey. And I with think the it, love of the Lord, not, you know, an emotional And this really again. surprised a lot of Turks, you know, as this went out into the media, because, mm-hmm. you know, they they expected that we would have a lot of bitterness, anger, mm-hmm. but but we were, no, we didn't. We say, we, we love Turkey. It's still there. And now, then were you afraid they were going to stop you from yeah. getting on the plane? Oh, yeah, yes, sure. yes. Uh, this went back to way beginning in the, or when we were in prison together, and uh, Andrew said, why aren't you crying? Are you holding back? And I said... I'll cry when we are out of Turkish airspace. I just felt that I felt like I had to brace myself. It wasn't done. Until so we're actually out, then anything can happen. Anything can happen. So anyway, and and the plane was so slow in leaving airspace, it went up the coast instead of kind of go, crossing over right over towards Greece. But once that happened, then then we knew, okay, now it's done. Now it's it's behind us. Yeah. So that was... That was amazing. Well, I was sharing with you earlier. I remember I've heard y'all share your story before on stage, and I've seen a picture of the two of you. I believe you were hugging on the airplane, and that was like right after you right. crossed the right. airspace. Yes. Yes. Right. I can't. Right. Honestly, I can't even fathom what that feeling of just to have your husband and yeah, you were, I say, going home. I know Turkey, you probably consider your home, but you were free. I can tell you my feeling. It was a detachment and not... It felt very surreal, and I think this is part of recovery. The the post traumatic stress is that I felt from from that point on, and the from the court on, uh, all of these things. You know, think of the roller coaster of you know conviction, sentencing, release. Within a day, we're in the White House, and, saying goodbye you know, to some people from prison quickly, to the White House, yeah. and so it's it, just the the roller coaster. But I felt like this is happening to someone else. This isn't me. I'm kind of observing it, and it, 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 all these amazing things happening, but it probably took me six months or so before I started to uh, feel less of that distance uh, detachment. It's not that I wanted to be emotionally detached. I think it's just part of the process. Now, you just mentioned you ended up in the White House. So you yeah. went from prison, the unknown. Felt like Joseph's story. <laughs> you know, Joseph goes United from States. the dungeon to Pharaoh's palace and like in a day just sudden and that's how it felt just like well tell us how that uh came about how did you end up at the white house kneeling and praying for the president of the united states so uh this really came from well why we ended up at the white house i don't know they they invited (laughs) us but uh you know the truth is that that president trump was so engaged A, a president does not engage in hostage negotiations or that kind of pressure. It just never happens. I point someone. But he again and again uh, asked for my release, had phone calls. A number of things in U.S. policy to Turkey were put on hold uh, at his orders. So, I mean, he really he really fought for us. And, and I think I'm, that's why we ended up in the White House. He was welcoming us back. Yeah, I mean, it was just so clear, the prayer. So we want to be very clear. We know that it's the prayer. that was This was God's hand. But God's hand was moving on President Trump's heart to engage. So, so uh, yeah. Noreen had had a dream uh, where she was trying to pray for the president in her dream and praying from Isaiah 11, which talks about the sevenfold spirit of God that was on Jesus, actually. And, uh, and, and every time she tried to pray this, she felt like this is, she's supposed to pray these verses, something would stop her. She'd be thwarted in all kinds of different ways mm-hmm. in her dream. So when she woke up from that, she thought, 
you know, God really, what, she doubled down on this. I am going to pray these these verses for the president. And she started praying them regularly for him. So as we're flying back to the station, you know, she, she told me this dream. And I said, well, if we have an opportunity, then actually let's ask God to make an opportunity so that we can pray for the president. You know, so this was something God had put in her heart. And I just kind of followed along with it. <laughs> and we asked the Lord before, before we went to the White House, we said, Lord, give us this opportunity. And then we, we looked for it. Mm. That he has been a, a fighter for religious freedom yes. and international religious freedom. And I'm very thankful for that. He has been bold. You and I, I believe we may have met at the UN for the first time when he stood before the whole world and called the world to this issue of religious freedom and how thankful I am. You know, as we close here on the podcast, as Americans, our freedom is precious and we don't even realize how great it is. And we can see how quickly life can change just with the last few months of a pandemic and churches can be closed. Freedom, we can lose it quickly. And what is your, your advice to Christians or to churches and pastors here in America in the days that we face? So the first thing is to be aware of that, that, that persecution uh, can happen and probably will happen. Uh, you know, Jesus said, that this would happen. Anyone who follows him, you know, I think Paul said, anyone who wants to live a godly life will, will experience persecution. So this is something I believe pressures are going to increase in our country and around the world. Uh, and being aware of it helps us to prepare. So if it's part of our mindset and we think my commitment to Jesus can lead to rejection, persecution, uh, maybe people will ridicule me. Any of those things that can happen in our country. Um, this can happen, and I'm going to prepare my heart for it. Mm -hmm. And so then when it comes, it doesn't shock us. Uh, because when these things come, the, the immediate response is to be afraid and to run away, to compromise, to do something to make this threat go away. So if we've prepared our hearts ahead of time and said, I, and made decisions, I will, I am willing to suffer for Jesus. I am going to stand for my faith. Then when that fearful, that, that experience, that situation that causes our fear hits us, we're more likely to stand. So we need the anchor ahead of time. We need to make decisions ahead of time. I am going to be faithful. Another thing that uh, is very important is cultivating intimacy and devotion. Uh, to Jesus. And the reason for this is that you are more willing to suffer for someone you love. Mm. Uh, and if I, if I love Jesus, I'm more likely to be faithful to him and endure difficulty, you know, if there is that love and commitment in my heart to him. Uh, someone said, you know, God has, uh, he has many servants, but few lovers. And the servant is more likely not to pay a price. The lover will. And so we want to be lovers of God because uh, that, that intimacy is what fuels endurance and perseverance. And the other thing is perspective, the right perspective. Um, I would call it fear of God, uh, which includes the right perspective, which is what really matters. And it is very difficult uh, when we're under pressure I had a very hard time thinking of my future reward. I was like, no, I just, you know, I want to be released now. And, uh, you know, Paul says, oh, these momentary afflictions, they can't compare to the glory that's coming. So, well, that doesn't really speak to me. What really speaks to me is my pain and suffering now. But I began over time to just focus so much on, on eternity and the day that I'll stand before Jesus and my life is evaluated, I didn't want to stand, I, I determined I don't want to stand before him with regret, that I, that I was a mm -hmm. coward, that there were assignments that he had for me that, that fell to the ground, were left undone because I ran away, because I wasn't faithful. And I began to do this every day, just press into this every day. I want to live, I'm living for the day I stand before you. That's what really matters now, that's not an emotion. That is something that I built up over day after day after day. And so I think it's important to begin to cultivate that mindset. 
know, what really matters is what God says about me. Am I going to fear God or am I going to fear the Twitter mob? Am I going to fear the consequences of obeying God, which is persecution, or the consequences of not obeying God, Mm -hmm. which are much more serious for eternity? And so that is something that we can we can cultivate and nurture in our hearts so that when the decision comes, I say, I'm going to serve God. I don't care if everyone opposes me and it may be difficult, but I've made my decision. What really matters is what he thinks about mm-hmm. me. So prepare our hearts. Uh, you know, be, be aware that, the, that this can happen and make decisions ahead of time so that when we are afraid, we stand. Love God. Focus on loving God because that will fuel our endurance and then have the right perspective. Mm. Being convinced that he is worthy and he is worth it. Which are a little bit different from one another, both important. Well, I want to thank you too for taking the time as uh, you're here in Alaska and speaking to these uh, to these uh, people that are listening. And I was thinking last night as I was preparing, and of course, I'm a verse you've heard before. It's Hebrews 13.3. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. And for you to share your story and to be raw and to be opening with that reminds us as Christians that we are not to forget those around the world that are suffering, that are facing religious persecution, that are in prison. And we as a church need to be standing with them and not to forget about them and lift them up in prayer. So thank you too. This was just quite a morning for me, and what a blessing. And we want to thank, thank all of you who prayed for us. That Absolutely. Really, that really brought us through. Once again, thank you for joining me on another episode of Fearless. I know you've all enjoyed today's very special episode. If you want to know more about Andrew's story, I encourage you to read his book. It's called God's Hostage, A True Story of Persecution, Imprisonment, and perseverance. I will put the link in my show notes of where you can find that book. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 